All right. Well, we at six recording. o'clock, should we get started then? Go for it. All right. So tonight, I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, she gave me fancy sharing powers. So I want. Okay. Uh, that's not where I want to start, though. Okay. So we'll go ahead and go through some of these. Hopefully it won't take very long tonight. Um, but what we have here, do you know any of these, Avery? I know the big one that kind of looks like a blade. This one? Yeah, that's used to trim horse feet. It's kind of like a nail file. -ish. Yep. Um, so all of these are actually farrier tools. Um, so we'll go ahead and go over them a little bit and share some more information on all of them. If I can get, I need to get my little camera so it's not where, okay. Um, so this one here, this is a um, clinch cutter. So what you'll do, what they use that for is it removes the nail clinches. So see this end, this is the blade side um, and then the point side. And so you'll use the blade side when they pinch those nails down, they have to then put them back out straight. So when they take them out, it doesn't damage like the hoof wall or anything when they're taking their shoes off. And so this helps with that. Um, so you'll take the clinch off with that and then you'll use that to kind of tap those nails back through. Um, does that make sense? Oh, hold on, let me find the right button here. Okay, so um, that's kind of what that does. Again, like you said, this is, they call this a rasp and then the handle for it. Um, and that's exactly what it does. It files the nail or the hoof down and makes it flat. Um, this one here is your, oh, there we go. Megan is editing. <laughs> um, we've got our shoe hammer or our wrath or driving hammer is what they ca also call it. And that's just used to drive the shoes or drive the nails in um, when they're shoeing a horse. You'll use a bigger hammer when you're shaping the shoe, but it's not pictured in this one. Do you know what this next one here is? Wait, does that hurt the horse? If you're shoeing them? No, it does not. It's just like clipping your fingernails or if you were to stick a needle through the end of your fingernail, like the extend, like the long part of your fingernail, you wouldn't feel it because it's just, um, is it creatine or keratin that they make that the- Keratin? Keratin, yeah, that the nails are made out of. And so like, it's basically dead skin cells type of a deal. It's just like if you were to cut your hair or trim your toenails, um, no different. Oh, go back. So Avery, do you know what this one next to the hammer is? Is that one also used for clipping a horse's foot? Yep, so they call these nippers. Um, you can kind of see, so this is not a solid piece here. Um, these actually work kind of like pliers. And then this is a sharper edge that you'll use to cut um, a hoof down. Make sense? Okay, our next one here is a nail remover. Um, so again, like our clinch cutter, it will help you to remove nails without damaging the hoof wall. Mm -hmm. Um, next, we have our clincher. So the they I think they call these alligator clinchers actually. They use this to help bend the nail down. Um, so they'll use this to bend the nail to the right angle in the hoof so it doesn't fall out. Because they use that, that's why you have to use the clinch cutter in order to get the shoe out. So kind of a back should have ran that first and then. 
This next one here, um, again, it's broken here, if you can see that, kind of like both of these ones. Um, this is your hoof tester. And so you can use that to check for sore spots in the hoof or if they have abscesses, um, those soft spots and whatnot will are testable using these. Uh, this one here at the end is your hoof knife. So um, remember how last week we learned about the anatomy of the foot? So you use this to help kind of clean out the sole and trim anything that's falling off of that and then clean out that frog and make that all pretty and nice. Um, and so that'll help aid in getting that all nice and clean and where you want it, kind of like um, we talked about last week. Any questions on any of these? No, that's all right. So we'll go on to some brushes. You probably recognize a lot of these. Um, I found this image and I really liked it because it kind of gave more of an idea of how they're used correctly um, and what they're for. We'll start at the top, the rubber curry comb. So I always really liked these because my horses were really dirty. Um, and so you could get that dirt off a lot easier and quicker. I would often use the curry comb to get the big pieces off and then, then the body brush to help settle the dust, get the rest of the dust off after I've used my curry comb. Um, then, so the difference between these two brushes, they're, they look a lot the same. Um, but so the finishing brush is finer bristles and it has more of them. And so that'll help kind of spread out those natural skin oils and get the dust off. It gives a, a prettier finish. Mane and tail brush, obviously for the mane and tail. Um, it's best if you start at the bottom with these brushes when you're brushing the mane and tail because then it keeps things from breaking, the hair from breaking. Um, and you end up with a lot less hair in your brush. I know that was always an issue for me. Um, a lot more hair seemed to come out of the mane or tail than what was left in it. The shedding blade's great for maybe not quite this time of year, but a little earlier. We probably use that a lot. Um, our big old gray horse we had used to shed like crazy. We'd have to use this and we took a whole horse off of him, it seemed like every time. Um, and then the hoof pick removes dirt, helps clean that out. You probably are familiar with a lot of these. Um, do you have any questions on any of these? I don't think so. All right. So um, this, we're gonna kind of go over like our Western tack. Um, obviously you got your reins and your bit. Um, you got your curb strap underneath. Do you know what the purpose of the curb, curb strap is? Is the curb strap sometimes like that tiny little chain that goes underneath their shin? Yep, that's exactly what it is. It keeps the bit from moving? Yep. Um, that It helps with that a lot, and it kind of depends. It keeps it from going through their mouth, and it also adds a little bit of leverage when you get into the shanked bits, um, it keeps, because when you pull on those, that's when it really is important that it doesn't pull those through. Um, so we've got our nose band and our tie down. Um, do you know what the purpose of the tie down is? So you'll see the tie down used a lot in like roping. Um, so what that does is it keeps the horse from being able to lift its head up too high and get in the rope, in the way of the rope. Um, you can't use a tie down in show. So like a quest, um, equitation, horsemanship, those types of things, you can't use a tie down. But if you're in your roping events, you're more than welcome to. Um, we've got our head stall. Wait, I so have this a one. Okay. How does the tie down, how does that fit to tie down roping? Or so, not at all, two separate things? 
Yeah, kind of separate. Um, this one is used just for keeping the horse's head down. They'll you oftentimes they'll use it in tie down roping, but it isn't specifically for that. Um, tie down roping, they'll have a rope that goes up here on their neck that helps hold the rope steady um, when they tie it to their saddle, to their horn. It's a little different. Um, but yeah, I know a lot of ropers will use tie downs just because sometimes their horse will try and pull, put their head up when they are swinging their rope or whatever, and it keeps them from one hitting their head and or their horse in the head and messing up their loop and their throw and whatnot. And so that's kind of an aid when it comes to roping. Make sure it makes sense. Oh, my words are tumbling today. <clears throat> so again, we got our head stall then. Um, we got our throat latch. Oops. How tight should your throat latch be? Should it be like super snug and up tight? Is it okay if it hangs a little bit? Yeah. Yep. Um, so yeah, a lot of these obviously are things you're pretty common with. We got your breast collar um, and that goes underneath, hooks to your front cinch. Obviously um, your blanket, all these ones up here, you kind of know. Um, so the back of your saddle is called the cantle. Let's see here. This one's not marked, maybe. So this right here, can you see my mouse? That's your skirt. And so that kind of, oops, protects your legs from kind of the stuff underneath here, like where your stirrups and whatnot attach. Um, do you have any questions on anything here? Understand this pretty well. We'll go to English then. Um, <laughs> so the English saddle is honestly quite similar as far as terms go, but it also has different um, terms compared to your um, Western saddle. So we'll start up here, you have your pommel. So the Western saddle also has a pommel. Um, we've got your gullet. Mm keep clicking buttons. So your D-ring, um, you can, you'll connect your breast collar if you use one of those on an English saddle to that. Um, the bar is where you'll connect your stirrups onto, or we call them irons in English, but same idea. Knee roll protects your knee and gives a little extra cushion for when you're posting. Your stirrup or, or iron, obviously, um, so actually we, something that's interesting to me, at least in your English, oftentimes when, if you're using the same saddle, um, you'll keep your iron. So the, this whole setup detaches from the saddle really easy. Like you can just slide it off. You don't even have to unhook the straps and whatnot. You just pull that off. And so oftentimes when you're switching, like if you're, riding multiple horses, you'll put the saddle on without the stirrups on them. And then you'll just switch the irons. Um, and so then you don't have to adjust your stirrups like you would on a Western saddle, which makes it super easy, um, I think. So obviously you got your stirrup leathers that holds your iron on. Um, something that's different on these is they have a twist. So right in the narrowest part of the seat, that's where your twist is. Um, that throws a lot of people off because they're like, oh, the twist of my saddle. And they have no idea what that is. And so that's always a fun one for me at least. Um, obviously you have your seat, it's the same as on a Western saddle and your cantle. Um, the panels here are kind of where your it's what the horse sits on. And if you look on the underside, they're like a little padding. Um, sometimes these don't fit all that great on a particular horse. And so you can get added cushion type deals that help put those in the right place. So it helps fit the horse a little better. Um, let's see here. 
I notice it doesn't have a horn. Why is that? So um, often the English saddle, so this is actually a hunter type English saddle. It's not a true English saddle. So your English saddles, your true English saddles won't have this high cantle. This is a jumping saddle. And so when you're jumping, um, you need to lean forward a little more and hold what they call a um, three point, I believe. And then that holds you farther forward that helps keep, the, keep you balanced over top of the horse and it helps them jump over those uh, large jumps. And so like the purpose of these saddles were originally for hunters. Um, so like your fox hunters, and that's why they have the higher cantle so you don't get slipped back as far and you can get a better leverage on over your horse. Um, if that makes sense. And so when you need to be forward on your horse, the horn kind of gets in the way of that sometimes. And so this is your more traditional um, true riding saddle. When you get away from areas like where we are, where ranching is a big deal, English is a lot more common of a discipline. Um, something that's really interesting to me is, is your, I'm trying to think, Australian saddles. They don't have a horn. Hold on. Well, we're going to look this up because I know Australian saddles are different. I should have had this on the Australian. Okay, so depending on which one you get, some of them don't have horns and some of them do. Um, so let me switch my screen share. I'm just gonna say, uh, whatever you see, we're still seeing the same saddle. What's a gullet yep. on that saddle, Avery? A what? That? It said gullet, G-U-L-L-E-T. Maybe one of the straps? Yeah, I don't okay. know. I thought you'd know. Neither do I. We'll have to ask about so I that. Have that. I have that switched. Um, so these are your um, Australian saddles. See how they have this. I don't even know what that's called. Let me. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the knee pad pommel swells. So really interesting if I can pull this up a little better. See how it has this area here that helps hold on a little better um, to your saddle. And obviously they have both the Western and the English versions of that, but your Australian saddles are just a little different than everything else. Um, let's see here. Let's see if we can get Okay, here we go. No, nope, that's not it. Oop, oop, I don't know what that did. Undo. So I'm. So these are your different types of like. English saddles. This is your dressage saddle, it looks like. Um, but you can kind of see that they have different types of English saddles, which was new to me, I know. Um, this looks like it says eventing. I can't really read the breast, but um, there's different types, which is really cool. Um, I didn't know that until we went to Tulsa that they had different types of English saddles. Um, and I noticed too, oh, here, hold still. I noticed too, and maybe Avery saw this too. Keep moving my screen, man, as I annotate. Sorry. Hold on, let me. But see how this appears to be a bit more narrow 
than a Western saddle too. Mm -hmm. Do you notice that? And I would presume, and I could be wrong because I'm not a horse expert by any means, but I would presume because most of the disciplines in that, in the English classes or in the hunter classes do require you to lean forward more. Mm-hmm. In most Western classes, if you're riding, like I think of Western pleasure in particular, you do sit back a little bit further on your saddle. Yep. Um, it be all wet. In, you'll notice the bigger difference is in the seat. So see how these tend to, they don't sit you as low. Um, you tend to be more forward, whereas this one has a deeper seat and it. This angle here is a little more steeper than some of these. Um, and again, part of that is in Western, um, your traditional classes such as like horsemanship and pleasure, you're not going to post with your trot. And so it's easier to sit if you have that deeper seat. Um, whereas these help it make it make it to be a little easier to post um, because typically in, in English, unless it asks for a sitting trot, you're always posting. Whereas in Western, if it you're always in a sitting trot. Um, and actually, Megan, for your knowledge, this is more similar to like this part of your saddle, um, your skirt. So this part here on your skirt on your English saddle is the same as this part, which is your skirt. Um, and then you obviously, this part here is more similar in terms of like right here, the panel. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, so definitely some different shapes. Your English saddles, when you ride English, it requires a lot more um, balance from the rider because um, you can't cinch up your English saddles as much as your um, Western saddles. Obviously, there's not that back cinch either. And so your balance, if you put too much weight on one side, your saddle slips a lot more and you can tell that a lot more um, when you're riding too. So part of, as part of the equestrian team at the college, we would ride English more for our balance, um, just so we had better balance when we went to ride in our Western. Um, obviously the balance is different, but it applies the same. Um, we did a lot of work without our stirrups to do a lot of that balance too. And it really just makes it a big difference when it comes to that. Um, trying to think, do you have any questions, Avery? Nope, not yet. What was the gullet on the saddle? What's the gullet on an English saddle? So I'll, here, I'll just pull, it's under the horn. So yeah, this is a better picture because you can kind of see it from the front better. So this right here is your gullet. Do you write English? Avery? Nope. Okay. I wish I, like, I never, I mean, my parents never taught me because we just ranched and so that was know. it. But I always wished, like, when I was doing my horse judging and stuff, and even as I was learning, that, like, I know they have better balance because they've learned, you know, how to do that. Mm -hmm. And I always wished I would have learned how to do that. And I just don't know enough about it, too. Do you it, ride with Karen? Uh, we just kind of started last year working with her. So, or I mean, I guess Cody came out here and worked with Avery. Um, um, some, but they do a lot of English or know about English, at least some. Yeah. And so if you wanted to, um, I have an English saddle that we're not using. If you ever wanted to venture into that, but. Yeah, it might require, I mean, I don't, I need to talk to Karen because I think it'd be good to at least do like a couple lessons, you know, just to have that, you know, at least figure out the, but I think right. you have to also have, I think when I talked to Cody about it, she's like, you'd have to have a horse to at least start out with that hasn't like done it before. Cause if you like take one of our ranch horses, it would be like a completely 
<laughs> you know, they're not used to where like the, you know, weight of, you know, everything sits and stuff. Right. So she was like, until you got them used to it, you probably at least need to try it on somebody's horse who's done that before. So, right. Okay. Yeah. So, but I think Cody said they had one that, you know, Avery could at least get on that would, you know, she could. Right. On, but I'm good. I think it's, I mean, I think it would be good for everybody to, you know, even like 4-H kids to be able to learn how to do that. At least yeah, I travel in it because you do definitely have better balance for sure. I enjoy it a lot, actually. Um, something else is it works your leg muscles a lot more. Um, which, like, I remember we rode English and I hadn't been riding a whole lot because of other stuff going on. But we rode English that day and I could not walk for about three days straight. And I don't think we ever got out of like a trot. Like, it wasn't even we were going super hard a lot of it was walking and sub trotting but my legs hurt so bad for the next couple days yeah I think it's it's definitely good for you yeah for sure. even if you don't do it at fair it's good practice yeah that's why I mean like I would even like to get her you know just this summer just to have a couple lessons with her just even you know if she never does it no. yeah like at fair just to have the experience and the mm -hmm. you know Something that it helped me a lot with is if I depended on my stirrups too much, when you do that in English, it just, you just lose control kind of your own body. And so it makes you kind of have to recognize that you're where your legs are more, because uh -huh. if you lean too much in one, it'll go too far forward or too far back. And it just makes things, it changes a lot in how you ride and it helps it helps me a lot recognize where my faults were. Mm -hmm. well, I think it makes you a better writer for sure. Mm -hmm. But I just never had that experience. And my parents are ranchers, hardcore. So it's definitely not something they were ever going to right. <laughs> take the time to teach me. So it just never happened. But it looks like here's a comparison if you kind of want to see. Um, there's a lot the same, but there's also a lot different mm -hmm. for sure. Any other questions, Avery? Mm -mm. Nope. Um, well, that's all I have on my PowerPoint. Do you want